I tried this Sony ZV E1 to document my days over a week, and here is what I genuinely thought about this camera. Perfect, except only one thing. How's it going, people? Thank you for coming back again. So, for those who have been waiting for the review of the ZV E1, it's finally here. I've been using this camera for a while, and now I can say I'm ready for the decent, full, detailed review of this. What is this camera? What can this do? Is this worth buying over other Sony cameras? There's a lot to cover, but I got you. I'll handle it. I'm gonna make a great, entertaining, educative, informative video as always, but I can't do it without you hitting the subscribe if you haven't, because to grow this channel, I need your support. All right, before diving into the detail, let's see the overview of this camera. Sony ZV-E1 is the world's smallest and lightest interchangeable lens mirrorless camera. 12 megapixel full frame sensor, come on, this size and full frame, wow. And Sony's latest and greatest image uh, processing engine, Beyond XR. Those make it possible to have uh, 4K up to 120 FPS, but you need a, like a free update. Photo to 10 bit color. 15 plus stop dynamic range and 5 axis IBIS plus new system dynamic active IS. Also, AI autofocus. And we have a lot of new and great functions that make shooting easier and more efficient. So, as you can see, this is very high spec camera, but the hottest topic about this, the you know most amazing feature of this camera is the build quality and usability. I can't help it, but starting from this. 1.06 pound. It is very small, but it weighs legit. You know what I mean? By the way, this camera that's shooting my hand with the ZV-E1 is Lumix S5 2X. Stay tuned for that video too. It's not too light. It has a weight enough so you can feel, okay, this must have a lot inside. This type of compact camera tend to be cheap when it comes to build quality, but this camera feels pretty decent. This grip is so much better than you think. It looks thin, you know, compared to like a A7 IV or FX330, but it is thick enough to hold the camera body. Surprisingly, it fits my hand perfectly. And also the body feels premium. I like this square design. I like it. So now let's look at buttons and dials. The basic style is still Sony, but the detail is different. First, there are only two wheels here and here. And this has only two custom buttons right here, C1 and right here, C2. But actually you can change functions of those buttons later. So technically there are like seven custom buttons, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, no, eight, nine, ten. Eight, eight custom buttons, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not bad, right? What I like about this camera so much is there is no mode selection dial. That's also the reason why I like FX30 as well. Look at this, the minimalist body. There's no switch or dial at the left side, and you can select a mode by this photo, video, and SNQ mode. And even this doesn't take the space at all. Also, this huge recording button, FX Spirit. And this zoom lever too. Well, I personally think this build quality is just right. Just so good. I mean, this has what you need, not more than you need or not less than you need. Just right amount of buttons and dials, uh, especially when you think about the body size. So physically, this lost the quick access to function, right? But you still can have it by this screen. And this function button right here, audio, uh, aerosolization, blah, blah, blah. I've been using this camera for a while at the many different situations and locations, but I never felt that this was inconvenient. I even feel this gives me a high mobility and usability, which makes my shooting faster and easier and more efficient at some point. At the last, let's see the small detail. This has only one memory card slot. This is kind of related to the conclusion, but the data size is huge. I mean, of course, it's, it depends on you know uh, how you shoot, but this can shoot 4K, 
you know, 14 to 10 pit. So the data size is huge when you use that. So I wanted to use CF Express as well as FX30. And other things are pretty normal. Here's a charging USB-C and microphone. Also, this has the micro HDMI. Well, let's forgive it. The monitor size is same as other uh, Alpha series, like three inch, but it's not the highest resolution, but it'll work. Although this lost uh, physical usability, it didn't get worse. It's a small and compact camera, so the image quality is not the best. You're making a huge mistake. Because this camera has a Sony's latest image processing engine beyond XR, which other Sony new cameras also have. So it is impossible that this has worse image quality because it's just small. So this 4K is not a like a 6K oversampling or 7K oversampling 4K. We can use everything from the full frame sensor, so there is no lack of resolution. But you can't use super 35 mm crop on 4K. But there is an alternative option, which is the clear image zoom. You can crop the image up to 1.5 times with this, you know, zoom on the screen or this zooming lever, wide to the photo. Technically, you can have you know, 1.5 times crop without uh, you know, losing resolution or detail. So now let's talk about the color. So this has those creative look and also S-Cineton PP11 here. Even without S-Log, this produces the amazing color quality. I use S-Cineton for 80% of all the footages in this vlog, but it was pretty good. Just normal S-Cineton quality, I mean, in a good way. Like same as other Sony's camera, A7 IV, FX3, 30. But I was worrying about that this might not have the you know good S-Log3 quality because it's too small to have it. That's what I used to think before cooking footages on DaVinci Resolve. But it turned out that this has the same S-Log quality as other expensive cameras. I was able to shoot and color grade in the same way, which I always do. No weird color shift or less color detail. 15 plus stop dynamic range definitely helps. Great detail on both of shadow and highlight. I haven't compared this with other Sony's camera yet, but so far I didn't see any differences when it comes to color. So now let's talk about the low light performance. Sony doesn't say this has a dual native ISO officially, but there are some vlogs that are saying this has 60, uh, no, 640 and 12800. Let's actually test it. So the lens gap on to see only how the noise changes. So this is lowest uh, 160. Oh, by the way, this test is for S-Log3. So lowest ISO 160 and goes up to 640 and jump up to 6400, the noise start showing up. 10,000, so rough. 12800, it got clean. So I'm not sure if the lowest native ISO is 640 or not, but at least higher native ISO is 12800, that is for sure. So using that in low light situation will reduce the noise than using like a 10,000. With this, you can use F4 confidently. This footage was shot on F4 ISO 12800, but look at this, it's so clean. I can say this low light performance is pretty much the same as A7S3 or FX3. So let's talk about slow motion now. This can shoot 4K up to 60 FPS without a crop, and there is no obvious degradation of image quality. Also, if you do the firmware update, which is for free, you can have 4K 120 FPS with 10% crop. Well, not that bad. When it comes to this slow motion, this ZV-E1 is better than A7 IV. Okay, now let's talk about this camera's unique functions. So first, the audio. There is a mic here, and surprisingly, you can choose the direction of this mic, like a, like auto, and front, everything, and the back. The quality is not that bad. When it's outside without a wind, it sounds pretty good. Although you need a sound editing a little. Camera, but I already love this camera so much. Inside, especially when there is no good sound recording environment, it's echoing a little like this. On this video, like. Uh, do I have to shoot more or do I have to end it already? I'm not sure about it, so. So I wouldn't say you don't 
need an external microphone at all, but it'll do, at least. And this has auto framing mode. The camera tracks the target changing the frame. It'll be cropped like this, but you can have a creative camera move by yourself like this. I think I'm gonna dive deeper in this section on my second channel, so if you are interested in more about this auto framing, just subscribe my second channel and wait for it. It's coming soon. Also, the cinematic vlog mode. So you can choose the color and the tone and autofocus, the speeds, like this. Also, black bars show up. Honestly, I don't use this at all because I edit footages anyway. But if you don't know a lot about shooting and editing but want to have the high quality uh, cinematic footages, this works pretty good. And product review mode. I guess this is not the you know only function for this camera. I guess the other ZV series also have it, maybe. Not sure, but I think so. But this is new to me. This allows me to have the incredibly fast and accurate autofocus, especially when you show something. Even this tiny piece got focused super fast like this. And also this has the user lot. Like right now it's S-Log, it's all flat, but you can choose like a 709, 709, 800% or you can import your favorite lot. Come on, you know, as well as FX30. This is a game changer. So now let's talk about autofocus. This has AI autofocus system which can boost the autofocus performance for human eyes and human body, no matter what you do. This recognizes your figure automatically and tracks you down to the hell. Without doing anything, it just tracks my face like this. It is very close to A7R5 AI autofocus. Also, you can change the autofocus target like a human and animal bars, animal bars, come on, animal bars and animal and bars, insects, car, train, airplane, like that. So I try the animal mode and continue shooting in photo, but wow, they were moving so fast as you can tell from those photos, but the focus was very clean and sharp. I'm not talking about this photography performance and ability that much, but it's amazing too, especially this continuous shooting with this AI autofocus. So at the last image stabilization, there is the new mode, dynamic active. But first, let's see the normal mode. Well, if you have one of Sony's camera, this looks pretty boring. I mean, it's pretty much the same. Even the active mode, yes, we already know. It's great. Sure, you can run without a massive shake. What we want to know is how actually this dynamic active mode is, you know, performs. The conclusion is great sometimes, trash sometimes. When there is a relatively less shake, you know, like just walking, this solarization is incredible, almost a gimbal IS. But when there is a constant shake like in the car, train or even running, this dynamic mode stabilizes the footage pretty well. The big shake just disappeared. But instead of it, you will get this tiny weird shake continuously. But if you do the gimbal walk and taking care of the shake, it'll work amazing. So I think you need to choose the situation when you use dynamic active mode carefully. When there's a big shake, you might wanna use active mode. Okay, that's it. I hope you guys enjoy it. Of course, it shoots pretty decent quality of photos, but it's pretty average. Don't get me wrong, it's amazing, but it's just not, you know, so outstanding. But when it comes to the video, it's better than a7 IV and FX30 at some point. Although this is a compact, small, not professional looking uh, camera, it's actually a legit pro-use video camera. Except the build quality for some people. If you have to use a lot of camera accessories like a monitor or follow focus or uh, external uh, microphone, you might want to rig it up because the usability for that is not good. So at the beginning, I said this is perfect. Uh, except only one thing, right? That is the gap between the spec and the position. Everyone, including Sony and YouTuber, is saying, like, this is a perfect vlogging camera, and this is the easy but high quality camera for beginners or even best entry level camera. First, you don't need this 
pro level spec for vlogging, and second, it's overkilling for beginners, third, it's too expensive as the vlogging camera. Vlogging and beginners, those two wars generally leads you to the budget, but with more than average spec camera, I'd say around like $1,200 or at most $1,500. But this is $2,200. Depending on where you live, it costs more. In fact, this is more expensive than FX30, $1,800. But the spec is pretty close. So that means this is not the camera for people who want to go for entry-level camera. This is the camera for people who want to pay uh, for the reduction of sizing weight, but need a FX video performance. Sorry for the long conclusion, but this is important. This is not just a beginner's vlogging camera. This is the pro video camera specialized in the lightweight. That's what I genuinely felt about this camera. This price, $2,200, is not for the spec. It's for the size and weight, the, this compact body. So this time, I took a lot of time for the conclusion, so the no cracks time today. But yeah, actually, that was the ultimate crux of whole story about ZV-E1. I hope this one helps your decision making. Okay, this is it. If you have any questions, just shoot me anytime, anywhere. And if you like this video, show me a thumb and uh, hit the subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Also subscribe my second channel. See ya. Uh, uh, jump.